Hello, everyone, and welcome to Live Academy, the virtual design learning platform by me and Middle East Architecture Lab. My name is Riyad Jokla. I'm joining from Dubai. And joining me from Zurich is Philippe Block, who will be giving a lecture today on some of the work that they're doing at Block Research Group at ETH Zurich. Philippe Block is one of the leading figures in advancing architectural research today, following some of the masterminds in shell structures, such as Fry Otto and Felix Candela. So it's really great to see this work being put in the context of today's tools and today's technological advancement. I'm really excited about that. And if you haven't already, please check out the upcoming classes on Live Academy. We have a few more for this semester. So we've reached halfway through this second semester, a project completely born in a lockdown. And uh, we've been having a lot of fun with it, connecting to people from all over the world and sharing their experiences, their work on our platforms. And stay tuned also for one more lecture that will be put out on Live Academy on semester two. And if you've missed any of the beginner classes, you can also subscribe to Live Academy TV and watch those classes there. This session will be recorded and will be broadcasted on our YouTube channel. So make sure that you subscribe to that and to get access to all the other lectures that you may have missed. The questions will be taken after the lecture is over. So you can ask a question by uh, hitting the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. I'll read out the questions after he has finished with his lecture. So if you think of a clever question, please post it there. Do not post it in the chat. Let's keep the chat for more informal talk. And the host will help me by posting some of the links that could be useful for you to get access to Live Academy TV and Live Academy upcoming classes. I'm very excited again for this lecture. I first got into Philippe Block's work by reading this paper that was given to me by Michael Weinstock, my thesis advisor at DAA. While I was pursuing my master's of emerging technologies and design program, the paper, which I couldn't find the name of, was around mineral surfaces, dynamic relaxation, and opened all these new doors for me to research and get to know more about these subjects that are very interesting. And then I had the privilege of a meeting at his office in ETH, uh, where I got to see some of the work that his team was doing, and that was bit before BRG was formed. So it's really great to see how far they got with their research. And I believe Philip would they share with us that journey. Philippe Block is full professor of architecture and structures at the Institute of Technology and Architecture at ETH Zurich, where he directs the Block Research Group, or BRG, together with uh, Dr. Tom Van Mille. Philippe is also director of the Swiss National Center for Competence in Research, NCCR Digital Fabrication. Philippe studied architecture and structural engineering at the VUB in Belgium and also at the MIT in the US, where he earned his PhD in 2009. He has won uh, numerous awards, including the Russell Prize for Most Promising Young Professor from ETH Zurich in 2018 and the Berlin Arts Prize in 2018 for uh, Baukunst Architecture. With the BRG, he applies research into practice with design and engineering of novel uh, shell structures developing computational structural design strategies to utilize digital fabrication and push construction innovation. To address the grand challenges posed by climate change, the BRG uh, research follows the motto strength to geometry to reduce the embodied carbon, use fewer resources, and minimize waste. I believe strength to geometry is the title of this lecture. Please join me in welcoming Philippe Block to his Life Academy public lecture. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Riyad, for this, uh, for, for this uh, very exciting introduction. I, I always am a little bit, um, I'm blushing a bit when I'm, uh, when I'm being mentioned in a similar sentence as uh, Heinz Isler and, and, and Fry Otto and so on. O obviously, big, big inspirations. And so it's, uh, it's, it is exciting, actually, that um, these kind of uh, historical structures uh, now really have a place and and uh, a relevance in today's uh, in today's design, uh, not just formally, but I believe also in how they appro approach design and 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 how they dealt with constraints of materials and 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 fabrication uh, strategies and so on. I think these lessons from the past are more more important than ever. And so I'm excited to, to share this through, through my talk today indeed. Uh, so thanks again for the invitation. Uh, thanks everyone for joining from all over the world. It's, it's fun to, to read where you're, where you're joining from. And I hope to, uh, to serve a little bit as inspiration today. 
Okay, so as announced, uh, strength through geometry uh, will be my talk. But uh, before uh, starting with uh, addressing what that means or uh, how we approach our design through strength through geometry, uh, let me maybe first start by framing um, why what drives me and why my research group does the research that it does. Uh, this starts by actually um, an estimate uh, by the the. the UN Habitat that in the next uh, 30 years, the world population is expected to grow by at least 20%, which translates to um, 2.1 billion more people on this planet. Um, this is a direct challenge, and, and but also opportunity for us as, as, as builders, but also as researchers and innovators, because uh, one way to look at this is that um, this has a direct repercussion on what needs to still be built on this planet. Um, this is a slight ex exaggeration, but one could say, uh, to round things up or to make it simple, that imagine everything that has been built uh, on this planet until today, that we roughly need to double uh, what is there in order to provide appropriate um, average housing quality and, and infrastructure to all these people that still need to be born. So uh, in 2019, Bill and Melinda Gates, in their annual letter, kind of really shook, tried to shake people up by clarifying um, the impact of building materials towards uh, cl the climate change and the environmental crisis indeed. Because this doubling of the building stock can also be translated, and this is something that they calculated to this, that we need to build the equivalent of one New York City every month for the next 40 years. So that is a, a gigantic amount of construction that needs to happen. And uh, the way we are constructing now, which I would argue is, is, is a barely evolved model that is stagnant in the last 100, 150 years, um, is uh, responsible to um, a huge amount of pollution. So um, for example, uh, CO2 emissions or CO2 equivalent emissions. So um, uh, another uh, challenge that we face is that we, uh, the way that we are building today, uh, I would argue without sufficient restraint, we are uh, irresponsibly uh, using our natural resources. Uh, so the, the virgin materials on this planet are not being treated um, appropriately. And then uh, lastly, our industry also um, would... Uh, is responsible for quite quite a bit of waste uh, production. Uh, I will come back to all of these things in, in a summary later, but then for completeness, uh, also energy is uh, on a global scale, uh, is, is a, 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 our industry is a ma major contributor. So just to summarize these initial kind of statements without going into detail, and again, I'm, all, I'm part architect, part engineer, so the engineering me will kind of round up things just to kind of... Uh, uh, get the order of magnitude correct. And this is easy to remember. Uh, when we look at pollution, when we look at resource uh, consumption, when we look at waste production, when we look at energy use, then we are roughly in all of these areas very close to 40% of the global kind of um, uh, um, uh, demand. And this is a real challenge. This is a real issue. And I, I tend to even though this might be known to some of you, I always want to start my lecture with these kind of numbers because everyone seems to be talking about uh, um, taking the bike to work instead of driving. Everyone talks about less, less, uh, less airplane and, and, and uh, travel and so on and so on. All of that is important, but I think the public is not, and some of our colleagues are not sufficiently aware of how uh, negatively impactful our industry is, and that, and I would, I would really um, want to give a call for action uh, and and for responsibility from our industry. So, with these few statements, I hope that you agree that uh, we need to change the way we design our structures, but also how we build them. And as a structural designer, so as this kind of hybrid uh, architect engineer. I feel particularly kind of um, uh, responsible because this is a very typical uh, picture um, that uh, that you see for multi-story buildings of at least 10 stories. So for uh, the medium high rises all the way 
to skyscrapers, this gets even worse. What we're looking at is that three quarters of the weight of the mass in a building is basically in its structure. And that gives this absolutely absurd situation that, or chicken or the egg kind of situation that the structure is hence mainly there to keep itself up. Uh, looking at the imposed loads, which are only 5%, so only a fraction of those are us, the users of the building. So this this really made me realize that that maybe there is absolutely something wrong. This was compiled based on some projects from SOM by Francesco, one of my PhD students, who, who was one of the main skyscraper designers at, uh, at SOM. Um, of course, you know SOM in Dubai really well from uh, the Burj Khalifa, which is a very exciting new structural kind of typology that allows to go higher without excess. Um, today's uh, lecture will mainly be talking about embodied energy. And I think that is also relevant because that is, um, I think, the, 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 the most urgent target to look at. On the operational energy, so that means like heating and cooling and, and things, so much, so much research has been done that things actually start to look better. And particularly if you look at uh, on the right of the slide, um, there the, the, the answer is very simple. If you can already go towards greener sources of energy, then actually it's not necessarily about reduction of energy, but it's just about how that energy is generated. So solar, wind, whatever, um, there's many smart things you can do. On the embodied energy, so that means the energy and emissions, sorry, I'm talking about emissions, I guess, um, uh, uh, that is much harder to actually, in current practice, to make a significant dent. So that is basically where all the pollution is hidden, in the building materials, in the making of it, in the construction, in the transport, and so on and so on. Um, this will be the only equation, it's not really a very sophisticated one, but um, the, that I will show, because it really clarifies very simply what, what our targets are. So this was developed by Catherine de Wolf uh, during her PhD at MIT. And you see, you see basically that if you calculate for all the components, all the parts, all the layers, as she calls it, in, in, a, build, in, in a building, in a structure, then there's two things you can reduce. Either the volume of material that you use, so the, the structural volume, or the impact, so the embodied carbon coefficients, so the impact of a specific material, how polluting is that material. And so through my lecture, I will actually demonstrate that if you get the geometry right, that you can achieve uh, much of this. And indeed, I will be talking about strength through geometry, but also something that we coined uh, material effectiveness, which is not the same as material efficiency. And I will come I will explain later why I'm, we make that differentiation. And then uh, we will, I will also show that we really use computational design and digital fabrication to, in order to, to actually bring these opportunities uh, into uh, the design practice indeed. So uh, our group has been uh, roughly uh, just over, so officially 11 years, but let's say that we have one decade of prototyping, of kind of uh, doing pavilions and great, uh, uh, great opportunities also with big name architects and so on. And, and so I will be, uh, I'm actually at the point where I'm sharing uh, what we've done, but actually already able to show an outlook and, and particularly also because some of these ideas we are now commercializing and I'll give you some first hints on how we're doing this. Uh, let's first look at opportunities offered by computational design and digital fabrication. I will talk at length about strength through geometry later, but here you already see, and this was a, a picture by one of the first PhD students, Diederik, um, uh, showing uh, a structural model, in a way, of a good doubly curved uh, shell. So this is a Pringle carrying 500 times its uh, self-weight as a bad loading case. This maybe already gives a hint about the, re uh, the resilience of good, good, good form, uh, doubly curved geometry. But you don't see too many of these uh, um, uh, beautiful surface structures here, for example, in concrete, only for unique projects because they need a unique budget, which goes to foundations, scaffolding, uh, months or years of preparation of the formwork, uh, which unfortunately uh, almost always uh, turns into waste after 28 days when the concrete is hardened. So that is where we very early on started to... Um, 
it evaluate if we could actually bring uh, fabric formwork and the, the shaping of concrete with flexible kind of formworks, if we could get that to a, a next level. Can these kind of methods really at a large scale provide uh, the, the precision that we need in real construction? The, 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 the principle is extremely simple. So on the left, you see basically a traditional formwork where you need a full foundation, you need to assemble uh, scaffolding, and then you uh, you mill or you um, uh, assemble a formwork that will be used only once, so that immediately is doomed to become landfill or or other types of waste. Uh, on the right, you see what we're after: so um, reduction in foundation, no support below, which also means that you can start to rethink the sequences of design and construction. Uh, but an important point to make here is that nothing comes for free. So on the on the left, basically, all these inefficiencies come into play because it's brute force. We're forcing the geometry to stay where it is. While on the right, if you want to have the efficiencies of a flexible formwork, then you need to design, you need to include the restraints and the constraints of a flexible formwork into your design from the beginning. Otherwise, uh, this will not work. A simple example, if you have a perfectly flat surface, if you want to do a flat floor plate, the, for example, then this will absolutely not work with a flexible formwork. So these are things that you need to consider from the beginning. So here, uh, this was a prototype that we did in 2017 for the HILO project, which I will be talking about later. Um, where you should see already in this money shot, perhaps what we're after. And for really large, um, uh, concrete shells that we can achieve this with a very little amount of material. Also in this project, we actually developed a kit of parts, which allows a very lean crew of only three people in the case of this prototype to assemble over the span of just one week, this uh, sophisticated formwork. Again, here I want to make you to try to imagine what would be the alternative. You would really be spending months, if not years of milling and prep work uh, before you could go on site and all of that gets wasted, right? So that is what we are trying to confront or find alternatives for. Um, it is a flexible framework, so we developed some scanning and then also new algorithms that allow to define a non-uniform pre-stress so that the framework would settle exactly where it needs to be. But this is where it gets exciting. So in this flexible framework, and these are key things like how what are the sequences? How do workers that are not necessarily, that don't necessarily have a PhD in form finding, uh, how are they dealing with these kind of new kind of uh, forming strategies? And that is where the node design, which was entirely developed and optimized, really played an extremely important role. The node was not only the connected piece, not only where the measuring devices were, but it also became a very simple axis that allowed basically to, to control all the next steps, like for example, to keep the reinforcements at a certain distance. And so you see from the top here that actually these nodes appear roughly at 40 by 40 centimeters. So this funky geometry is for the worker on site is reduced to something extremely simple and manageable of a very small patch of 40 to 50 centimeters. And so that allows that suddenly then also, you know exactly how thick the concrete uh, needs to be everywhere because you have these local references and that allows you to create, this was a prototype in 2017, um, a shell of 20 meters by 10 meters by seven and a half meters. So a 180 square meter surface of concrete of only three centimeters at the end and eight centimeters towards the support. Um, something that you might also critically look at here is that this shell was not perfect. And that is why we did this prototype together with our industry partners, with all the ones that would be doing it on site. And they knew exactly what happened where. So all these imperfections, they guaranteed to the client that they would not happen in the second run in the real project because they knew why things happen. This is something that is, uh, this, if you have the opportunity, that you learn the most when you really challenge yourself, not just in the bubble of a university, but you do it together with your industry partners. Um, after this project, we wanted to push things a bit further and we thought, can we do even better? Can we use a fully 3D netted technical textile that has all these kind of components embedded? And here, this is still a hybrid of a cable net and a technical textile. 
um, to go on site with something that is super lightweight and has all the smartness and features in it. This is the work of Mariana. Uh, here she is standing in front of her knitting machine. So this knitting machine is actually designed to make sweaters and, and kind of standard, standard garments, but also um, um, technical, uh, technical uh, components. And, and this is where we're really using this machine. It's a very simple machine. So it, it has two flat beds that you can start to then really uh, program uh, to make non-standard kind of uh, 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 textiles. The important message here is that, um, of course, we want to automate the entire generation of all of that. So we, uh, from the design, these, these, uh, the G code for the machine is very simply generated. But the key reason why we went into technical textiles, uh, knitted textiles, is because by introduction of these short rows, which are the red kind of lines here, you actually can generate non-developable surfaces. Uh, so that means that you no longer need cutting patterns, that your 3D geometries come out of the machine like that. So we tested this on a project in Mexico City with Zahadit Architects. And here you see Mariana and Lex laying out which what is arguably the longest scarf in the world, which then could be folded up, vacuum packed, and then brought on site uh, just in two suitcases. But here, the key thing is that like we use the node, the design of the node as some sort of a logistical device. So something that allows to streamline the processes on site. Here as well, the knit actually embeds a lot of cleverness. So the knit will become, you will see this later, it's a two-layered knit that allows the insertion of uh, inflatables to, to shape the surface. It has all the features and the references to insert a cable net so that it has this hybrid action as we had in the other uh, the other uh, project. And so here you see, by the way, these balloons being inserted. Uh, we did that because uh, we couldn't go for a heavier shell. And so uh, this three centimeter shell that we kind of could count on uh, would not work. And so we wanted to have stiffness in two directions, very much like a Pierluigi Nervi shell with stiffness running in two directions. But that would cause a very, very expensive framework. And so here, this was very simply done by including inflatables into the two-layer knit so that you could make these cavities in these pockets. But then, and that is exciting about uh, interdisciplinary research, is that we teamed up with our concrete wizards, our concrete magicians at ETH uh, Zurich. This is Lex Reiter, for example. And they developed this very cheap, fast-setting uh, cement base that allows this flexible knit to be just stiff enough so that it turns into this beautiful uh, Swiss chocolate. Um, but more importantly, that it's actually a stiff enough geometry for um, the local uh, craftspeople, so the concrete experts, to finish this shell. And this is something where I want to pause for a second because I believe in strategic strategic insert of digital enhancement and not just taking over the entire process. So here we did this project in this crazy time frame. Now we'll talk about this later because I, I had worked with Mexican, um, uh, Mexican expert laborers before and I knew that they, they, that they could finish anything in concrete. So what we basically gave them is a, a, a bit of a more interesting canvas, I guess, to do what they typically do uh, best. So I like this kind of, um, or I find it uh, not only I like, but I find it also extremely important that uh, that we value and understand basically the opportunities that we also have in the different contexts that we uh, build and construct. Uh, for this project, uh, as I said, which we, uh, as I mentioned, we did together with Zadid uh, Architects for one of their exhibitions. We also wanted to exp uh, expose the knits in order to give another expression of uh, the harsh concrete shell on the outside and a very interesting, soft, tangible kind of inside uh, here. So on the top view, you see again how thin this structure is, but its thinness is compensated by the stiffening ribs that run in two directions, which give it that additional structural depth and basically efficiency. But now this is maybe where it gets important. The entire formwork, so the cable net, the knit, the, the, the stiffening paste, all of that cost only 2,500 US, US dollars for 50 square meters of formwork surface. 
It weighed only 25 kilograms. So that meant that we could really bring it very efficiently on site. And that package actually contained all the information to assemble it so that we could do it with local workers. So Mariana was basically there with with, with workers that she had never met before, but everything came together because the the um, the the, the um, complexity was embedded in in the knit itself. But perhaps not unimportant, um, the formwork for this five ton shell, so fifty square meters of concrete, uh, took only thirty six hours to knit, and this this of course in stark contrast with the rough the estimated 750 hours that you would need to mill an equivalent surface. So again, it's not just about time because 750 hours would mean three months of non-stop milling. It's also about the shipping, the logistics, and then the waste afterwards. So these are things that we are directly criticizing with this technique. Then sharing with you that uh, in between the very first email, uh, that we were invited by Zahadit Architects and then the opening of the exhibition. So what had to happen in between, there was design, prototyping, engineering, fabrication, and construction. All of that happened roughly in the same time that we would have needed only for the milling in a traditional approach. So next steps for us is also not to just to uh, apply this at a full building scale, but also to develop custom nodes for uh, very lightweight, uh, prefabricated custom uh, solution for, for complex geometry, more on a component kind of side. And then uh, not unimportant is the, it's not just about shaping the concrete, but also the reinforcing of the concrete. And so we are now finalizing a project where this lightweight package that comes on site also has all the reinforcements embedded. So I think this will be quite exciting indeed. What is more efficient, what is lighter than sending 25 kilograms to site is to send data or even better to send instructions. And this is where uh, uh, building upon these kind of ubiquitous uh, machines that are available all over the world because uh, uh, garments are being made all over the world, this, this, this uh, could cause a distributed prefabrication factory, which is, uh, of course, an exciting output. So now we get to uh, challenge ourselves again uh, in a real project. So where the question mark is, is where this kind of unit would come. The large roof that I showed you earlier was a prototype for this project. So we will be demonstrating indeed this, uh, this non-standard lightweight system that basically allows to bring this kind of geometries back into our vocabulary, right? And I care about this because these are structural geometries that really significantly reduce the volume of material again. Also, what's exciting is that I mentioned earlier, we developed this kit of parts. And uh, more than 85% of the components that were used for this prototype actually are now used for the final geometry, even though the shell got updated quite significantly. They're on top of a building. Uh, it's a two-layer layer shell. This also has to do with building physics. There is an insulating kind of layer in between. But obviously, this sandwich uh, concrete uh, construction helps us for structural reasons as well. And maybe something that I want to emphasize here by clicking to the next slide is that this note and this clarity and this simplicity of the note with, it, with its clear axis, we pushed to actually also directly on this note, we connect the, the shear connectors and then the space holders for the reinforcement on top. And then these nodes go all the way to connecting the, the waterproofing and then even attaching photovoltaics on top, so on top. So this kind of simplicity of actually managing this complex geometry through that one prefabricated, pre-designed nodes, that is what makes it project now suddenly very obvious to be done with, with partners that are not experts in custom construction indeed. In a real construction, there's many other things that need to be added. So we, we had to go to all kinds of details, like for example, how to have the glass facade disappear when you have concrete flowing from the inside to the outside. So this is, for example, this detail that was developed and prototyped we had to demonstrate to our clients that we could build within five millimeters of tolerances, which is absolutely absurd for concrete construction. But uh, this was required because of the novelty of this, uh, this, this, this formwork. But I am also looking forward to the, the imprint of the fabric. That's one of the key kind of uh, 
um, very unique features of a fabric formwork, of course, that will be left in the concrete. So here um, uh, I'm sharing some, some images of the building site. Look how clean it is, not only because we're in Switzerland, but also because it's designed as a, as a very simple prefabricated system that easily comes together on site and can be clicked together uh, with a very small crew. And then after, so here's some measuring again, because it's a flexible formwork. So we need to be precise also. So what you, safe on, on, on getting rid of the brute brute force you need to add in algorithms and smartness. And so here you see uh, our team, the BRG, assembling this formwork. So we're not just computational experts, but by now also, I guess, experts in complex, in assembly of complex uh, formwork systems. So here this thing coming together. And uh, this was a state before the client uh, um, uh, went, uh, asked for a break for the winter not to risk it because of temperatures. But then for us exciting, this is uh, three, four weeks ago where they started finally with the first layer. And indeed, now we have the first of the two layers already built. One thing that I want to emphasize is that we have been developing for the last five years this open source computational framework for architecture, structures, digital fabrication. So really a collaborative platform. And I, I want to highlight this because this is what makes these kind of projects possible. So it basically allows to bring the gray bubbles or different research uh, groups at ETH with novel strategies that are not ready to be tried typically in, in, uh, in, in real projects. But then we find a way to basically generate the relevant material for all our partners and to collaborate with partners that many of them have no computational expertise whatsoever. So it's something kind of beyond beyond BIM in a way as well. But the key thing for us to develop these frameworks is to start sharing methods, is to start sharing experiences, is start to learn from each other indeed. Okay, let's now go to the main kind of topic, uh, strength through geometry. And then again, I will talk about material effectiveness later. I did my PhD at MIT. Uh, on uh, developing a new method for uh, assessing the safety, the stability of these kind of beautiful historic structures in unreinforced masonry. And if, uh, if you have had the luck to see these beautiful vaults at King's College at University of Cambridge, maybe something that you don't know is that these uh, shells are proportionally as thin as an eggshell. So the thickness to span ratio is similar to if you were to cut an egg in half and you measure that mini span and you measure its thickness. This is absolutely remarkable that this is, this was done with, without reinforcement, without the typical redundancy that we have in mod modern engineering. So, um, these tools that I develop, uh, that, that this method that I developed then landed into Things like Rhino Vaults, the tools that we did, uh, developed to explore these kind of uh, elegant geometries. But as you as you might know, on the computer anything is possible, right? So you can simulate whatever you want, and that is why we used the 2016 Venice Biennale to make a statement to really clarify what it really means to get a geometry right. What you're looking at are is a, a stone vault with 399 cut pieces of stone uh, held together by just equilibrium, by geometry. So these, these big pieces of stone, these 25, uh, 24 tons of stone is held together. Is, uh, there is no mortar, there is no reinforcement, there is no glue. So this we did really to, to kind of start a discourse, to clarify to engineers and architects that actually with very humble materials, you could do amazing things indeed if you get the geometry right. So here is some just one image of the assembly, just showing that there is actually nothing holding this together than, than, uh, than uh, just contact and gravity. Of course, before we do these things, we do a lot of prototypes. These are probably some of the oldest things we've done, still from 2011, around uh, uh, a bit before we, uh, I met Riyadh for the first time. We, uh, we did this, this first kind of... Uh, scale model unreinforced masonry and, and hitting it to see really if it was working as we designed it. Uh, this was a tile vault, so inspired, again, looking to the past for inspiration. These are these beautiful vaults of Guastavino 
the Guastavino Company in Grand Central Terminal, which is the main train station uh, in New York City. Um, these vaults were built without forework, so they were built in stable sections using a lightweight tile and a fast setting mortar. And I was lucky to already explore this kind of amazing techniques in a, in, I was involved uh, in this project uh, by Peter Rich Architects with a structural designer, John Oxendorf and Michael Ramage of Cambridge that, that, uh, much of the development and the follow up on site. I was lucky to be able to assist in the engineering of these unreinforced, uh, vault. What was unique about this project is that it's, had to be done with as much local resources as possible. So here you see local laborers, which before learning this technique uh, were basically uh, farmers and carpenters and the, the most handy people uh, to be found in the neighborhood, uh, in, in the surroundings. So here you see this, this technique going on um, uh, uh, using this uh, faceting mortar in white to basically uh, build in stable sections into all the timber that you see is uh, not formwork. It's basically to guide this literally unskilled labor force to follow these right, uh, these uh, structural geometries. But the reason that I'm the reason that I'm showing you this project is because for me it was one of the most eye-opening experiences of my entire career, and particularly because of the contrast of these two images. On the right, you see the tiles being carried very carefully by women. Uh, to the building site in very small packages. And that is because these tiles are designed, they're just local soil compressed. So without firing them with a little bit of cement to stabilize them. So about 7% of cement. And, but these tiles are designed to only take two megapascals in compression, which is a 10 or even 50 times, 15 times less than a standard concrete. But if you hold this tile in one hand, then they snap in bending. So these tiles have to be brought on site extremely carefully. But then on the left, you see that if you place these tiles where the flow of forces wants to go in compression, then you basically uh, transform that weak material into a full, fully safe, uh, entirely safe, fully structural material indeed. So if you don't activate double curvature, so positive double curvature, like we did in the armadillo vault, the stone vault that we showed at the Venice Biennale, then uh, you need to do something else. Because an arch is a very good um, shape for a certain loading case. But if you have live loads, point loads, so the users, for example, then the red line uh, represents the flow of forces in compression to the support. And so what you basically see is that you can no longer contain these forces within the section, which would mean collapse. So a, a strategy that was used in this project and in many projects uh, later and, and before as well, is actually to locally add more structural depth in the form of these kind of vertical stiffness. So what you see here, uh, what, what that does, it basically adds, it allows a load path in compression uh, for the forces to travel to support. Uh, to the supports, and if you add a tension tie, then you basically resolve the horizontal thrust. And basically, what you have, what we have just done in the last 20, 30 seconds together is we have just created a super efficient, 70% lighter equivalent of a floor plate. So, so this is something that I want you to remember because this is just by reintroducing geometries that we are no longer used to form, uh, to, uh, uh, that are not really uh, being used anymore. And so this is uh, not just a small improvement, but really a disruptive change, a disruptive improvement in efficiency indeed. So this was at Mapungubwe. There, of course, we did it to try to challenge the so-called low-cost housing, uh, where they're just trying to mimic how we built, but doing this in extremely wasteful ways. So good geometry uh, matters in many cases, and we have done some fun projects like compacting waste, like Wally, to make this uh, uh, temporary construction out of tetra pack, so compressed car, uh, uh, orange juice and milk cartons, or where we um, uh, demonstrated uh, in mycelium that an arch can also be fully 3D as a branching structure, and this is a 100% mycelium construction that stood uh, for one year. So you're, you're, you're looking at three and a half by three and a half meters kind of a structure. So a nice, a nice size indeed. But instead of uh, introducing this, some call it vernacular kind of language, always in a developing kind of context, 
These kind of things are relevant for us as well in a more developed context. And that is where, after being challenged by my colleagues, I realized, indeed, we're building all of these floors, and this is not an untypical kind of image. And coming back to uh, some of the initial statements, why uh, what really drives me is that in this, if you continue the analysis and actually break down where this structure, uh, where the weight of the structure is uh, going to, then you see that more than half of that 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 mass is actually in spanning sp uh, space. So the floors is a super inefficient way. Uh, is a super polluting. That's where a lot of materials and hence pollution is in. And this is where I want to step back and maybe talk about something else and about um, uh, material effectiveness indeed, is that I believe that we need to have a much more nuanced kind of discourse and discussion about sustainability because sustain, uh, you, you will find efficiencies if you can activate locally sourced materials but you use these materials really how they want to be used. And that is why here I want to bring back that um, this, this best of 2019 article in The Guardian, which I find a very important advocate for sustainability and action indeed. The way it is today, it is 100% right. Concrete is the most destructive material on earth. But that has to do with how we are using concrete. We're using concrete in almost everything, and we're not using it as it wants to be used. Concrete is basically an artificial sandstone. It's a hybrid It's a hybrid stone, and a stone masonry wants to be in compression. So, uh, and, and why I say this is because if you look at both the embodied energy per mass, you see that cement is doing not great, but also not that bad compared to many other materials, including also uh, the, the timbers and the woods, and certainly in, uh, compared to, to steel and aluminum and, and even more problematic kind of materials. Do notice that this is a logarithmic scale, right? So that this is an exponential relationship and not just a linear relationship indeed. But as I try to argue, uh, the energy is maybe part of the equation because the energy you can try to get from greener sources. Uh, it's maybe the embodied carbon coefficient, so the the equivalent emissions, uh, uh, CO2 emissions that are important. And there you see that also per unit mass that actually, I mean, it's very hard to beat sustainably sourced timber, but we cannot build the entire world in su sustainably in timber. Plus, for many infrastructural projects, timber is not an option whatsoever. Then you see actually that Concrete is, again, doing not that bad compared to the typical building materials that we use. So it's not necessarily about concrete being so bad, but it's how we use concrete. And that is why I want to come back to this thing. If we use concrete in a reinforced concrete structure, basically against its nature, then we are also wasting material. We are irresponsibly using this material. We are irresponsibly using the resources and we're polluting without needing to. So by reintroducing the arch, the tight arch, indeed, we can just save these materials. And that's where we started to develop these floor plates. So here, for example, for a five by five meter span, by externalizing the tension ties, we can reduce the structural thickness to what it needs structurally. And in fact, the two centimeters of thickness actually comes from uh, fabrication constraints more than anything else. This also we already showed in 2016 uh, at the Venice Biennale. And this is a nice uh, test case of a fully 3D printed, sand 3D printed prototype. So with material properties equally weak to what we used in South Africa. So two megapascals in compression. So remember peanuts, basically barely any compressive strength. But if you take a piece from this floor, you can just snap it in your hand. So here what we're doing is we're demonstrating that we can, we can apply all the, all the loading cases that are needed and this floor is still uh, safe. This is another version of this. This is one, 1 1.2 tons of ETH nerds standing on a two centimeter uh, floor system. So if you think that what I'm saying is absolutely crazy, then maybe I want to return to these beautiful vaults at Grand in the oyster bar in Grand Central Terminal. Because they have a similarly weak material, they have similar ratio of thickness to spans. These are about 20 meters and, and, and a 15 meter kind of thickness. And, um, 
But what I didn't say here is that these vaults are also carrying the Vanderbilt Hall on top. So if you think that what I am showing you is kind of crazy, what is he talking about? Unreinforced concrete. This has nothing to do with safe modern engineering. Then we should warn the millions of New Yorkers that are going to work every single day because the Vanderbilt Hall is indeed one of the two main entrances to uh, the, the biggest train station in, in New York. So again, coming back on the impact, just by introduce, introducing little shell action within the typical structure that we would have, this could make a big difference because again, more than 40% of the weight in these kind of constructions is in, uh, is in the floors indeed. Another opportunity we get by activating these cavities, by actually using these voids where structure used to be, uh, to start to rethink also the integration of building systems rather than layering them and by increasing the structure, um, the, 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 the depth of a floor, of a typical floor in a, in a high rise uh, construction. So how cool is this? This sounds like win, 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 right? So we do a significantly better uh, on the weight, on pollution, but we could also offer at least 25% more real estate to our clients. So maybe one thing that you're wondering is lightweight construction is known, of course, to have uh, acoustical kind of issues. And this is again, and this is, is a very uh, beautiful, congenial uh, uh, surprise, is that rather than the typical strategy for lightweight construction, so lightweight timber, lightweight steel construction, they, in order to be acoustically performant, particularly the contact noises or the transmission of the most problematic, which are the low frequency lo noises, one tends to add mass. So typically in the form of a continuous concrete layer, for example. And uh, here what we're demonstrating, what we demonstrated in the work of Thomas is actually to use structural stiffness. So again, geometry to very efficiently absorb, uh, absorb these problem, problematic frequencies rather than adding mass. Something that is very, very common, is quite common practice in the airplane industry, of course, because there they cannot afford, like our industry, to use brute force because adding mass would just mean your, your airplane doesn't take off in deep. So maybe to step back, I also, um, there's now two attitudes. I love structural geometry. I think this can be very beautiful. This can be expressed if you want to. But I don't want to impose it as a style. It, I, it doesn't matter to me. It, if you want to keep your flat hanging ceilings and so on, why not replace then your structural component with something that is indeed 70% lighter as one sixth of the embodied uh, um, carbon just on the savings of the concrete? Um, because the stresses are so low. So remember what we've done in South Africa. We can actually activate weaker materials. So uh, the, the floor that we are now building in the same pro project, in the Hilo project, is made out of 100% recycled aggregate, so made from construction waste. And then the cement also actually uh, uh, uses 50% 50, uh, 50 recovered uh, uh, active components, again, from building waste. And then uh, maybe interesting is that because we separate compression and tension, we don't have this awkward mix of materials and that makes everything much cleaner to, uh, to, to maintain. So longevity is important, but then perhaps at the end of life, we, we have a very clean recyclability of opportunity. So this maybe already sketches a little bit kind of the, uh, the uh, why we're doing this. But let's do a quick calculation together. So a medium high rise. I mean, in Dubai, this is, of course, not even a high rise. This is kind of a, a midget building. But um, there is many. There is need for many of these kind of towers all over the world because we want, we need to also densify our urban urban areas. So a 25 story building is not uncommon. So this is a very traditional kind of strategy. And uh, here, this we already talked about. On the left, you will always see a flat slab. On the the then by introducing post tensioning, you can already significantly reduce by 20 percent the concrete. You can have the concrete if you use the, that's a detail maybe, the current floor that is under construction here in Switzerland still had to make many, many compromises because it's the very first one, unreinforced concrete shell floor. And so there we already hit 50%.
But then we know that uh, if we have the time for this development, that we can easily get to a more significant saving, and that is the one on the right. So um, on the total concrete volume, so that means of the entire construction, that means a reduction of uh, at least 35%, right? So what does it what does that mean? 35% less concrete in this one building of 25 floors. That means 7,500 cubic meter of concrete less. Or equivalently, that would mean that we would need, if we were to build it with concrete trucks, that 1,208 concrete trucks less would need to go to the building site. So this is a significant improvement uh, indeed. And this is again for just one building, but actually, where we save the most is in the reduction of steel. So as already mentioned, the high low floors are currently under construction. So this is a fully engineered, approved kind of construction, already almost 90%, but we will do better in the, the RFS, the Ripman floor system that we are now developing together with industry partners. And more specifically, look at this per floor, you can, save 22 kilometers of 12 millimeter steel bars, right? And, and both are important because we already talked about the impact per unit mass. So this, the very large savings on the concrete, of course, are important, but cause actually half of the contribution towards the reduction of emissions, of pollution. Because steel is so much more polluting, the smaller amounts of volume that we have to reduce still has a very large impact and half of the benefit comes from that. So it's actually a nice kind of again showing that these historical principles brought back because of opportunities of co new computational methods, both to design and engineer them, but more importantly, also opportunities in large-scale digital fabrication that can start to challenge also economically the status quo. Again, we need solutions and I, we are excited about these solutions. And indeed, we are now commercializing this. In fact, we, one of our key industry partners is Basics, the contractor of the Bush Khalifa. And that is why we're working with them, because they, are, they have, of course, that international reputation and they know what matters. They know what matters when you go up and where the bottlenecks are. But then this is also something that I want to mention again, is that we can lead by example, but it's not... In Europe, it's not in the Western kind of context where things will happen. Africa is still exploding and Asia, particularly India, is growing a lot. And if we build like we built today, we will absolutely destroy our planet. We need to start building more responsibly. I'm happy that uh, uh, governments are putting more strict re re regulations on carbon emissions and so on. And I'm also very exciting, excited that we are now doing a a project with developers in India where we're transferring uh, this floor idea in a very different context in the lowest cost housing solutions. And the same, we are working with the government of South Africa to also introduce these same ideas. Um, and that is maybe exciting about what I have to tell you today is that good geometry, structural geometry is relevant in any context, but you do need to translate it and to make it relevant for these different contexts. That is also why we are committed and we remain committed to develop tools that are open, that are transparent, that educate the designer, that you really understand what you're doing. And in that sense, RhinoVault 2 is now really an open source computational platform for funicular form finding uh, based on Compass. And uh, again, so Compass offers you all these methods that basically we have been developing with our colleagues, experts in architectural geometry and structures in computation and so on. And, and, and in a way, RhinoVault 2 is just a UI. It wraps these kind of, uh, these kind of uh, packages that are already available. But then uh, because it's based on Compass, uh, very soon you will be able to do full funicular constraint form finding using RhinoVault 2, not only in Rhino, but also in Blender, uh, in Grasshopper, in uh, the browser, and so on and so on. So this is something uh, to look out for. We recently did this workshop. So if you look up RhinoVault 2, I recommend to uh, go to the workshop we have given at Digital Futures because it nicely gives you, um, you can uh, teach yourself uh, with the same steps that we uh, introduced it to the students. 
So for us, uh, uh, Riyad was uh, talking to me earlier, and it is super exciting to see that these kind of tools have an effect on others. So not only our own group uses these tools, but on the bottom uh, left, uh, this beautiful tile vault that was built in Barcelona in the bottom middle, that is still the Guinness World Record for largest 3D printed shell uh, designed with Rhino Vault on the bottom right, an exciting overlapping shell designed with Rhino Vault. Uh, um, uh, done by the team of Philippe Yuan, Archi Union in Shanghai. And then one of my favorite projects is uh, the one on the top right, done in India by Sami Padora and Architects. A beautiful, beautiful little uh, uh, library extension to, to an elementary school done in a remote location with humble means and local, uh, local workers indeed. Um, so... We as a group are really committed to share our tools. So on Equilibrium, we share all our teaching material so that you can, so that we can expose graphic statics and, 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 and structural design methods to more people. So please go check it out if you're curious about this. Rhino Vault 2, 2 is brand new. So it got released uh, last Friday, but already got tested by many people. And so we hope to build up a community that you can also start to contribute and even Together with us, develop this tool further to your needs and so on. And then most importantly, the development of Compass, really fully open source, a platform where we can share uh, methods, where we can learn from each other, where we are not all reinventing the wheel, but we are really working together because our industry needs it. We need to work together in order to attack the big challenges that we have, the big uh, climatic challenges, the productivity challenges in our industry and so on. So what I told, uh, talked about is that with structural geometry, we can use less material. By activating funicular form, which means compression only logics, you can, uh, because they have lower stresses, you can use uh, weaker materials, which typically means that they are less polluting. So you can use better materials indeed. So again, remember local, locally sourced materials, recycled materials, even grown materials like the mycelium, we really will, will be pushing in the next years to demonstrate that these materials can be used 100% as structural materials as well. But then these geometries are non-standard, right? So you really need to see opportunities in computational methods and digital fabrication to try to address, can I challenge the status quo? Can I challenge these forward systems that have been developed in the last 100 years? Can I not generate all this waste and so on and so on? And that is where I hope I convinced you with a few kind of uh, hints that uh, a lot of innovation can be found there as well. So with that, I'm done with my talk today. Uh, this is our website. There is a lot of uh, work to be found there. Um, follow us or me on Instagram. Uh, we're not that active, but if there is the latest available, we will be uh, sharing it with you as well. And um, after this, I'm uh, also very happy and uh, excited to hear uh, your questions and, and to try to kind of uh, uh, clarify things that maybe were not uh, clear enough indeed. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Philippe. If you can uh, unshare your screen now, yeah, that's great. We have uh, quite a few people here on the live session and some people watching, uh, watching us on YouTube Live. Unfortunately, we'll not be able to take the YouTube Live questions. But for people joining us on Zoom, uh, more than happy to answer your questions. So please post them in the Q&A uh, box or use the raise hand tool so that you can ask your question live on video. And uh, Philippe, really interesting lecture. And quite, I mean, I think you were maybe a bit, uh, you know, underplaying it when we first spoke uh, on this uh, talk uh, because it was a lot different than a lot of the talks that I've seen from you. So. Thank you so much for sharing that with our audience. It was amazing to see how you uh, took uh, your interest in geometry, material research, and um, computation and applied it in different contexts, which I, I found the most interesting part of your lecture because, you know, it, it, a lot of people argue that a lot of these uh, interesting spatial narratives and interesting spatial ideas and uh, big visions for architecture are only applicable in certain places that might be more economically privileged or might have more advancement in engineering or technology. But you have proven that wrong and uh, you've applied it in different contexts and different scenarios, uh, juxtaposing that with traditional methods yeah. for construction, which I found super interesting. In this talk. Thanks, Liat. Can I maybe directly respond to this, actually? Um, 
When you say proven wrong, uh, not quite yet. I mean, we have given some hints and it takes a little bit more effort actually and persistence to demonstrate this. And I think so uh, to start, what we have tried to do in Mexico City is actually to to identify, to acknowledge what are the strengths and what is the relevant input of technology indeed. But then actually what I what we see actually as, as a next step is that not always when you then engineer and design that you need to full pipeline and the sophistication and complexity, but that you start to learn from what we've done there and try that we try to kind of translate it in 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 key principles. And that these key principles that we then explain how you can or develop uh, strategies, how to combine them. And so for me, that is actually the next step, because many of the things that I've shown, um, to be honest, and it's maybe also obvious, there is a lot of pre-design and engineering before we even go on site, right? And so I think there we, can, we, we have to think of strategies. How can we bring the sophistication, the opportunities of geometry to a broader audience and an audience that is not all of them experts in computation. And that is where I believe kind of also developing tools that that kind of um, expose to what is behind them, but nonetheless give some sort of an intuitive kind of exploration like Rhino Vault 2 or Rhino Vault for that matter. I think that is that is quite quite important. So it, it, there is a lot behind it. But actually, we're still exposing the things that matter, the relation between geometry and forces and things like that. Another thing that we're recently exploring is actually to use our, and I can be very straightforward about this, our very privileged kind of conditions to do a lot of upfront uh, digital prototyping and so on to try to develop, for example, a brick that has a certain geometry that when implemented in a different context, has that robustness that you can really activate local unskilled labor and things like that. So I just wanted to clarify a little bit that I don't think we've proven anything yet, but we have some hints of maybe good strategies. Yeah. It's, a, it's a fantastic start and very exciting indeed. We have some questions piling up here. So uh, I'll take the first one from uh, Coco, who is asking a question from Indonesia. I don't know if you've had the opportunity to, to go to Indonesia, uh, Philippe. But if you ever make it there, I was there at the beginning of this year, uh, luckily before the lockdown, and I had the opportunity to go to this amazing place called the Green School, where uh, a, a duo, an architectural duo from Canada, uh, residing in Bali for a number of years, have started building these incredible structures out of bamboo and yeah, yeah. It shows you the potential and the resiliency of the material in uh, so many different uh, scenarios. So I highly recommend it. But uh, Coco is saying, and I'll read the whole thing. Uh, my sister Katarina is an architecture student from Indonesia. Unfortunately, she is not able to join the lecture today. She asked me to ask you a question on how to stay authentic as an architect. As we all know, uh, that is not very every client. Uh, as we all know, not every client are good and also educated about architecture. But sometimes we are being questioned and doubted on our works. Thank you. Yeah. I okay. Uh, <laughs> Well, I, 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 it's, it's, it's a question that could be very loaded. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll just give my take on it. By the way, I first want to comment a little bit on your comments on the bamboo and so on. I want to emphasize really that, um, what I've, what I showed here is maybe a strategy is, a, is an opportunity. You really want to do things with the materials that you find locally. And it's true that in many parts of the world, bamboo is, is a ready available material. And so that also re refers back. Oh, I forgot to explain the difference between material efficiency and material effectiveness. Mm -hmm. So um, that means that you want to use the material how it wants to be used. That I explained this with the, with the concrete, the unreinforced concrete. Because if you go lightweight, that is not necessarily always a solution. If you use highly polluting materials like carbon fiber and things like that, then you offset all the benefits almost immediately. So I wanted to talk about this and the same in regions where you have bamboo, go towards shapes that make sense in bamboo so that you stiffen your geometry by bending them. Then you have this, 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 this bending active behavior in that and so on. And then you will hit new efficiencies indeed. Mm. To come to the question, so how to stay authentic as an architect, I personally think yeah, it's a challenge and it's, it's, I find it too bad and frustrating that, um, uh, architects and des designers that really have good attitudes and, 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 and intentions often 
need to kind of resort to so many compromises that at the end it doesn't it doesn't come out anymore. And I don't know how to change this. I am hopeful that the the, the combination between the public opinion that that uh, that everyone seems to start to acknowledge that we need to do that we need to build more responsibly the 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 climate uh, um, uh, strikes and things like that, but also governmental pressure that actually through the regulations that as an architect, you will be challenged to no longer build like that anything is possible, but that you need to come up with better solutions. And so I would actually want to to expand that question to, you talk about architect. I want to talk about uh, designer. I, I think we need to, we need to, no longer separate all these different categories. The, the architect, the designer, the engineer, they all need to come together to come to, to smart uh, solutions. And I don't know, I, I live, of course, in a, in a bubble. I'm in academia. I get to do exciting things. So maybe my comments here are a little bit uh, out of touch with reality. But I do have the feeling that there is much more awareness, a growing awareness of people that want to do things differently. And that start to even almost be willing to pay more for it. Like, like we find it, we seem to find it obvious that we pay a little bit more to have bio food rather than food with pesticides. So something similar should be offered for, for the building industry, that there is a, an appreciation actually for, for those qualities that an architect can offer, right? And it's, it is really the architect that can, that can also educate the, 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 the client to do better. I'm not really answering the question because I know that is a bottleneck, that is a reality, but I hope that with regular regulatory kind of pressures and just also with image kind of issues or kind of also that it becomes almost obvious that we want to do better. I hope that we get to that that place soon, but let's see. Yeah. The only thing we can do is in the, indeed to 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 keep innovating and to try to 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 provide uh, solutions and to educate our clients. Yeah, I agree. I also find it interesting that you took uh, an amazing uh, academic institution like ETH as an umbrella to kind of uh, foster your interests and, and your repertoire, so to speak, yeah. within, because you obviously have a lot of uh, incredible resources there. Uh, Firas is saying, wonderful presentation. Thank you. I love the organic forms that emerge from the computational processes that you've shared with us. Was there a time at some point that perhaps your forms or designs or algorithms were inspired by geometries found in nature, mm -hmm. i.e., to what extent is your work inspired by nature and natural geometries? Yeah, it's kind of funny how often that question come up because uh, the shapes that, that come out somehow have a natural, I'll call it natural, I mean, they're entirely scripted, they're entirely programmed, they're foam found. They're, there's nothing natural about it, quite the opposite. They're made by robots, right? And uh, no, I, I, I kind of say it like that because um, I think something natural comes out because of similar pri principles of equilibrium, of balance that also nature abides by. Uh, of course, that is what's behind our algorithms, right? And so I think then what emerges uh, uh, starts to look a little bit more natural. Um, we actually have never, to honestly, we have never started from inspiration from nature, but these kind of natural forms have emerged. But in a way, and that's that's the thing. So gravity is nature, right? Um, uh, uh, reacting if efficiently. So what has evolved uh, over time in nature, uh, there is no surprise that we that that we that nature and and we <laughs> uh, end up with the same geometries, right? And so it's. Uh, um, but yes, there is uh, also uh, our famous colleagues in in Stuttgart have demonstrated that actually there is valid and valuable kind of hints to be found in nature. But just as an answer to your specific question, uh, we never started from that from there. Yeah. Interesting. Anonymous is asking. I'm an architecture student and would love to uh, do a research on digital fabrication. Go further. I'm kind of lost on where to start. Can you suggest what to focus on and what are the points to keep in mind? When, uh, <laughs> okay, that is a very, very open open question, but I, I do have something to say there. I think in digital fabrication, we are hopefully towards the end um, of uh, people being fascinated by the new opportunities of fabrication and by the new geometries that come out and so on. I think digital fabrication really becomes to challenge the status quo when you actually, when uh, your design and the opportunities, but also restraints of the fabrication techniques go hand in hand. 
and where you, where you're not just having a geometry and then you fabricate it, but where you really question what does that specific fabrication method can do better. Like for example, with the knitting. The knitting is actually, it's much better than, than 3D printing or bending uh, kind of reinforcement because you can place material where you need it. You don't need cutting patterns. You can do a uh, 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 non-continuous kind of uh, 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 material stiffnesses and so on. So that is where we started. So we, we actually evaluated what, what is specific about knitting and, and, and then what can we actually achieve with that. A similar kind of idea is with 3D printing. So concrete 3D printing is super popular, particularly obviously in Dubai, mm -hmm. but most people are kind of using it as a, at best as a stay in place form work where you're trying to fight against reinforcements and so on. If I might have given perhaps a hint in my presentation that there is also another way to look at 3D printing, it's kind of like mini vaulting. And if you align the 3D printed layers to where the floor, forces want to naturally flow in compression, then that material directly becomes safe and structural. And you don't have to kind of uh, uh, scratch your back inside out, upside down, in order to try to insert reinforcement steel. So that's for me another kind of example. Like if you, if you would have started by actually looking at exactly what does concrete layered 3D printing do, uh, do, then you would, I mean, I am convinced you would not even think about the reinforcements, because you would have immediately embraced the strengths and the opportunity of these new methods, as an example. Right? Very interesting. I definitely have some ideas after your presentation on how we can do some 3D printed structures with Rhino Vault. So there you go. There you go. <laughs> nice, nice. Hey, keep us in the loop. I mean, that sounds great. Yeah, that's so definitely. Uh, John Four is asking a more specific question. Thanks, Philippe. Uh, thanks, Philippe. I, uh, if I may have two questions. Uh, what kind of joints were used for the stone arches in the Venice Biennale? Yeah, okay. I'm not um, sure. That's probably the first question. So the joints there, so, okay. Um, I didn't focus too much uh, on the Biennale, but we actually made some very simple, we made some six millimeters only, little grooves. Mm -hmm. So grooves that were male, female kind of joints. And the yes. reason that we did, uh, sorry? Stereotomy kind of system. Yes, exactly, yeah. And the reason that we had to introduce those is first and foremost because uh, the shell is quite thin, so it had four and a half to five centimeters of contact. And in order for the masons to know exactly how to align all the stones, these registration marks are very kind of um, uh, obvious. But a key reason or an additional reason to do this is that um, this stone vault is entirely dry assembled. So in the computer, everything might perfectly fit. But in reality, you might have a millimeter, a gap, wherever. And actually, it doesn't matter how big that gap is. That means that you don't have contact. That means that no compressive force can go there. That also means that the vault would settle a little bit. And so basically, these little registration groups make sure that even if you don't have perfect contact, so that's basically acknowledging that the real world is not a computer and that you need to deal with tolerances and unavoidable kind of accumulation also of tolerances, that at least the stones cannot locally slide off, right? That you have this little groove that keeps everything together. And so there is, I mean, it comes entirely out of pra pragmatism. Pragmatism for assembly, but then more importantly, to actually um, be safer on the engineering, to have that infinite friction block uh, at every stone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a bit of a detail, but it's a nice insight. It's something that worked really nicely. Super cool. And we have a couple of really nice comments on the chat if you'd like to read them, but I'll save the time for the questions. Uh, Subham is uh, asking, how about if bamboo uh, was an alternative for steel uh, and readily available, or if it's readily available and uh, using bamboo on a funicular construction and vaulting? Yeah. Something that. Yeah, do. we've thought about this. and. We've thought about this, and particularly because early experiments with bamboo had issues of differential kind of uh, expansion and things like that. That is why there is this natural beauty. It's a natural marriage almost between concrete and steel because they have to, they they happen to have uh, the same thermal expansion, so that no additional kind of uh, stresses occur at the interface between these two kind of components, these two two kind of elements. Um, Particularly in our case, actually, we are looking at bamboo or, or, or other kind of timber or even woven natural fiber kind of reinforcement strategies because we separate the compression of the tension. 
And so that offers us indeed no compatibility issues between these two materials. But also another kind of challenge of bamboo is uh, you have ways to indeed treat bamboo, but they're very kind of toxic also of, often. And by separating the two, the two elements, you, you can keep the bamboo nicely kind of isolated so that you can replace it over time and you can check if everything, uh, um, a long-term behavior is really uh, still where you need it to be. So yes, thanks for noticing that. And I'm excited actually to hopefully uh, soon have an opportunity to actually combine uh, the, the mud or, or I would say even soil concrete like materials uh, together with bamboo. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Aloia is asking, thanks for the wonderful insight, Philippe. Uh, you mentioned the actions you are taking to convince Africa and Asia to adopt the application of this research. What are the challenges uh, that are there now to fully adopt, adopt this yeah. application to, into these countries? Yeah, so, so um, I, I was lucky in my earlier career to have some opportunities to work, work in developing world con context. So uh, you saw South Africa, but I also did a fair amount of work in Ethiopia. And there... Um, the bottlenecks for me were kind of that um, uh, is the education, is the continued development together with the local developers and, and the local educators. And actually to set up a program where you don't, and that happens too often, where you don't just have one pilot or demonstrator project and then you step out and it's like, ah, nice, and you feel good and you did something and then you hope. But that is not going to be copied. And if it were to be copied, then maybe it will be copied wrongly and, and unsafely and so on and so on. So that for me was initially the bottleneck. It's a bottleneck of actually um, uh, not just coming in, inserting an idea and disappearing. That is a very almost colonial kind of idea, right? So you really need to work together with local kind of partners mm -hmm. that also have the capacity to work long, long term, right? And that have that stability to work long, long term. And that, that is what we really need to start to do. And so in that sense, now I do have the feeling that because we're working with a fairly large developer in India and with the government directly of South Africa, that we might have that opportunity to transfer things at scale, right? And so I think that is, um, that is something that, that uh, I never, we never managed. And, and to be honest, I mean, many of these beautiful projects that you see being publicized, like the the Kere and so on. I mean, they're very local, right? They don't deploy in, in larger kind of things. And I think uh, we need these, these right partners that believe in these kind of ideas to try to help us scale this up at a meaningful scale. And mm -hmm. so let's see. I mean, it's, uh, but that, that was until recently the bottleneck. And hopefully I've, I've found the right partners to do that. And so I, yeah, anyway, it's, it's, um, it's a scaling up always. It's also the same with our research, right? You can do one exciting pavilion that gets a lot of attention, but that has nothing to do with trying to make an impact economically viable, challenging, really kind of implement, uh, uh, influencing practice and industry. There is so much more to do. And it, it often comes back with who is willing to take the risk. Yeah, yeah. The financial risk more than anything, because any development, like the really good ideas we have in academia, there is a lot of work, a lot of investment needed to transfer those into something that might have relevance in industry. And because our industry is not valued, like, for example, we, I talked about the food. We are willing to pay more for food. We are willing to pay more for clothes that have a certain kind of quality to them or that are being uh, uh, treated sustainably. So people seem, but that has not triggered yet into, into, into building. Uh, people don't understand why we should invest more money. Why? Uh, because we are polluting so much. We're prob probably, um, yeah, causing severe health uh, damage to many more people than people that are influenced by cancer research, for example. So this is absolutely this is an, an a, a change in attitude that we need to do. And I think actually we ourselves, as architects, as designers, as researchers, are not vocal, are not clear enough about how much influence we could have and hence how much more funding in academia, but also funding in research and development in practice is really necessary for our industry. Uh, we have uh, quite a few questions here, so please. Sorry, I should be shorter in my answers. Huh? I, 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 I mean, take every answer as an excuse to say all kinds of other things I forgot to say, but uh, I'll try to be more to the point. Yes. <laughs> 
it's it's great that we get the most out of you in the session. So uh, like the only uh, parameter here is your time, um, but we're, we're we're ready to you know. Um, Arun uh, Prasad is asking, uh, could you please suggest a course to learn? Because I really want to learn these modern techniques and building strategies to construct uh, to construct buildings out of you know, parametric style and tectonic styles of architecture. Well, I mean, I, I, I think also actually this COVID situation might change a lot of things. The same with your life academy and so on is that 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 material is getting more and more available. So I I gave three links of certain resources that we have made available. But um, yeah, just be on the lookout. This is the moment. I mean, many people are being much more open and sharing with material. And I think we all should be. We all should be open source. We all should be helping each other. We all should be sharing our knowledge so that we can learn from each other and actually be proud when when someone uses your stuff to do amazing stuff. Uh, building, I, I think that is the best thing ever because that's better than doing the project yourself. You don't have any stress, you don't have and so on. And nonetheless, something beautiful emerged. So open source is beautiful. Sharing sharing is awesome. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. And Aaron, I mean, uh, as Philippe kindly mentioned, we have a few classes here on Live Academy where you can learn some of these methods. Uh, maybe sometime in the future we'll have a Rhino Vault class. Also. There you go. Yes. Maybe maybe you do. Yes. <laughs> Okay, uh, Faisal is saying uh, thank you for the very informative uh, lecture and thanks for uh, thank you Faisal for joining. What is the balance between optimization and design? How do you decide the, on the ratio between the intervention as a designer with the aesthetic sensibilities and the algorithms making design decisions based on optimization parameters? I sometimes have difficulty with this and would love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. So actually, how we approach this is um, uh, so I, we actually never really use optimization. We um, rarely, sometimes we do, but almost in all the projects that you've seen, they're not projects of optimization. What we actually do is we actually define our design framework. I mean, we're computational designers, so we kind of set up a custom design tool that kind of really looks carefully at, again, the opportunities and the constraints of the fabrication methods that tries to embed as much kind of ideas of logistics and, and, and possible bottlenecks of construction. And then with that tool, and of course, in our case, uh, our tools will always generate compression only or shell structures and so on. That is a given for what we do. And then within that constraint framework, we start to explore, right? And so that means that everything we generate, we know that it's close enough to something that is feasible, right? And so... So I don't know if that answers your question, but so it really is not about optimization for us. It's more about picking the relevant constraints that you want in that design to adhere to. For example, if you want to activate a low quality material that I can only take compression, then we, we extend something like RhinoVault 2 that anyways generates only compression only solutions. But then we add, for example, an opportunity or a logic of a fabrication kind of strategy. And, and that means that we kind of restrain the solution space of Rhino Vault a little bit tighter by the ones that can also nicely be done with a certain fabrication. And by, by approaching a design project like that, you actually get rid of the issue of the black box algorithm that does something without your control. Then you are in control. And you're in control because you designed your tools. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Uh, Melissa is asking a question about the RFS floor system. You mentioned your tests being 3D printed with sand. Going forward, how are you producing these slabs? Yes. Okay. So uh, fair, fair question, and I kind of ignored it a little bit, is that we are doing different strategies because it's important for us to, to kind of focus on the right things. And the first thing is actually resolving uh, the engineering questions, the, the, the kind of robustness and so on. So we're focusing on the geometry. And uh, we are kind of targeting first, maybe kind of um, an element, a component that you can almost uh, order in a catalog where you basically get through economies of scale. You can use a little bit more standard kind of solutions or you go to a semi bespoke kind of solution. So mass customization when you have sufficient floors that repeat in a medium high rise and things like that. So that is the first target. But then indeed, like the 3D sand printing, I mean, that is for me a structural material anyway. So if we have done all the longer term testing on 
Uh, is it toxic to use these materials? Is it fire resistant? Uh, what is the long-term be behavior of these materials? Or also direct concrete 3D printing of these floors will be the next targets in the next two to three to five years. But now we just started in July a development phase where we have given ourselves with our industry partners one year, maximum one and a half years to go from this first demonstration in Hilo to a ready product that other designers can start to include in their in their projects, right? But but we are for the moment kind of um, uh, reducing the expectation on full bespokeness, right? So our initial target will be uh, repeatability, right? So I mean something is if so if something is robust and resilient that you can use a thousand times or a thousand years, that is equally sustainable. As mm -hmm. making something that uh, doesn't produce waste, right? So it's it's always about balancing all these things. Absolutely. Um, I know I was just saying thank you for this uh, brilliant lecture. I would appreciate if you elaborate more about the ways in which we can get rid of acoustic problems in this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so for this, maybe uh, look up the work of Thomas Mendes. Uh, and so he's an alum also on our webpage. You can find a few uh, pages. It's actually um, the so uh, transmission noises. So the problematic, like walking, for example, that you witness in lightweight buildings, like in timber, old houses, or steel buildings, and so on. Or similar problem actually happens with low frequencies. The high frequencies you can dampen with mechanical dampers and so on. But if someone is uh, having a rave on top, then you will hear the bass in your in your apartment, for example, right? And um, so that is that is actually exactly for those problematic kind of noises. Structural geometry, stiffness can actually absorb these frequencies like you would do with a lot of mass. And so it's actually a vibro acoustical problem. But again, I would refer to Thomas Mendes and his research and maybe also to get in touch with him if you want to know more about that. He is a BRG alum who is now assistant professor in uh, University of Washington in Seattle. So he'll be very happy, happy to give you all the details that I cannot give you for now. But uh, what I was sharing is actually, again, kind of maybe an, an, other, an other kind of point of view, like with the flexible formworks, right? That maybe there is opportunities if you take these kind of strength through geometries opportunities um, in the design process. And there seems to be something equivalent in acoustics. And so it has something to do with vibrations and dampening those vibrations because of the shells are so stiff uh, you don't have this it's not like a flat play a pain that can vibrate like a drum but you basically observe them right that's that's a core concept as i understand but i'm not an acoustician so uh, get in touch with Thomas. so it acts a bit like a sponge to basically absorb some of these uh, vibrations yeah. yeah so there you go marcelo you should look up uh, that work uh, we have a question from asma and from pakistan uh, she's saying the idea of using natural fiber fibers is very int intriguing, but I wanted to know if we can deal with natural weather like rain and floods. How can we deal with natural fiber? Uh, look, no, not everything is appropriate everywhere. Like also, for example, these very weak tiles that I was talking about in, in, in South Africa, uh, that is a region where there is no earth uh, seismicity, right? That is why you can build like that. And so in other projects, we have embedded some natural kind of um, uh, meshes or, 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 or ropes in order to give the shells a little bit of uh, resilience. So they will still be irreplaceably damaged, but they will not collapse suddenly, for example, right? And the same with fiber, the same with rain. Um, if, if, your, if your structures are exposed, to your, your earthen structures are exposed to water all the time, then you need to find a way to deal with it. Either you give it very good, as Martin Rauch, an expert in, in earthen construction, says, a pure earthen construction needs very good boots and a very good hat, and then you're fine, right? So basically, he, he wants to say with this is keep the water away. If you cannot keep the water away, then you need to go to other materials. Then earthen materials are not your solutions. It goes together again with what I said earlier, right? That... Um, if we now always say that stabilized earth, so meaning earth with cement, is a solution for everywhere, then related to this question, then you would need to add so much cement to make, you, make your earthen construction uh, resilient and resistant to water and so on, that it's again very polluting. Then you might as well use have used your local bamboo and your local kind of timbers that are perfect in this kind of situation. Mm -hmm.
How come you haven't tried perforations in uh, these shells? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, why not? <laughs> no, there's no reason. There's absolutely no reason. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a good suggestion. Why not? Maybe it might happen. Yeah. <laughs> no reason. I really enjoyed the padding, uh, the inflations that you added in the. Uh, the little balloons there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Robert is asking, I've been interested in fabric for concrete for the past 15 years, influenced by the work of Mark West. I've used Adina to form find a concrete panel using a ge geotextile material. Could Rhino be used as well? No. Um, I mean, yes, yes or no. Look, um, uh, Rhino Vault, I, I assume you, uh, uh, the, the question is about. Rhino Vault is about um, exploring equilibrium shapes. What, what, what you're asking in your question is actually a little bit more advanced there, you really want to understand a very careful kind of material behavior. And so while we actually form find without even thinking about materials, so we are generating these forms. If you, if you don't want to understand how a specific material actually finds its geometry, yes, mm -hmm. then you need other tools. But you don't need to use Adena and sophisticated tools like that. You can also do this in a dynamic relaxation kind of way, which is much more lightweight. And uh, there is some good work on this as well. Um, uh, uh, in Kangaroo, you can do a few things, but but also um, uh, Diedrich Veenendaal, uh, one of our former PhD students, has a has a few papers where he describes what it means to materialize your model, basically to take your abstract models and then to start to impose material properties and see how it behaves then. No, so I think you're using the right tools. I mean, as soon as you want to exactly know how a specific material, then you need to model that material, right? Then you need to take the indeterminacy of beautiful static indeterminacy in 3D. There is millions, gazillions of beautiful compression shapes that could happen. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you decide specifically what material, what kind of cut of sheet of fabric, then it will settle in one specific geometry indeed. But what you're doing is a hard problem anyway. So it's, um, yeah. So, uh, Rhino Vault is almost the, the first step in that process, or you'd say? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, indeed. I mean, so Rhino Vault, uh, then after that, you, you still need to engineer it. You need to understand how specific material kind of solutions then will, will respond under live load cases and so on. But actually, they're, um, uh, referring, for example, back to the Armadillo Vault in the Biennale. If you if you have a good starting point and you have good double curvature and, and robust geometry, then you will see through the engineering that you actually have done 90% of the work. Then, then, then you're there, right? Anonymous is asking, how are you able to navigate uh, the different building code requirements in different cities and how hard is it to convince clients? Yeah, so to be honest, we never we never follow any building codes. We we just do first principles. And if you're lucky to work with, with good engineering firms, then that is also how they approach it. And then they will, obviously, you use as much of the building codes as is readily available and, and, and simplifies your life. But for the type of things that I showed you, it's true that it is, it is reduced to first principles. So it's really engineering basics in a way. It's gravity, it's equilibrium, it's stability. And so then you indeed need to be able to team up with an engineering team that that actually um, that 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 is willing to 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 then uh, go all the way with you, and that takes liability, right? So that is that is very clear. So convince clients. I mean, there I also have to be clear that uh, we haven't had the opportunity to do so many things for clients yet. Um, I I just I that is also why maybe first we are trying to go more on the component kind of scale, like just replacing something that we need anyways, like a floor slab. And replacing with, with something that is certified, worked out. We did, uh, the fire test and so on. So that no one is nervous about something that naturally also from history should work and so on. And, and maybe that is a good starting point because there we have very objective numbers. If we have done all of this in our development, then we can say, look, it's that much cheaper. It's a fraction of the pollution. It's this, this and this. And we can offer it at the same price or roughly the same price in the bigger picture and so on. And so, um, yeah, there I just have to say, like, look, I don't have too much advice in convincing clients because that's maybe why I'm an academic. That uh, my job is to provoke, is to think ahead, is not to have to deal with clients. 
Mm. Um, and to try to develop things that more and more become relevant for, for practice so that uh, we all together, it comes back to the other question about being a consul- an architect, like uh, um, uh, that we that we that we have more an, a better arsenal of solutions somehow, right? And that's what we do. So it's kind of a little bit of a cheeky answer because I'm not answering it at all. I'm avoiding it. But um, uh, yeah, no, that's indeed not easy. So maybe some of the things that I'm showing are a couple of years too early, mm-hmm. are still not mature enough, indeed, for real industry kind of. Uh, um, uh, industry kind of uh, uh, introduction and application. So maybe you could see my lecture in two ways. That it's we shouldn't just focus on all the bad things, the bad influence. That there is opportunities that I want to encourage everyone with me to come with uh, hundreds of solutions that we will need to build better. But also, uh, I can already share that that my, in my experience, industry is eager and is willing to invest in good ideas to bring it together with you to practice. And so hopefully in a year or a year or two, I'll I'll come back here on Life Academy and I'll share what we have done then. And hopefully we will have had an impact and I will not be embarrassed that everything I said was hot air. But I don't think so. I think we're up to something. And actually what's maybe nice, sorry, I'm babbling, right? But one thing that is maybe nice is that these these systems have proven themselves through history. They have they 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 are basements of historic structures, vaulted kind of beautiful buildings all over the world are still standing happily after so many years. So actually now with the opportunities of digital fabrication, computational methods, and the spread the pressures of climate change, this is the moment to bring these beautiful forms back. This is really the moment. Absolutely, and uh, we would love to have you uh, back on uh, Live Academy, Philippe. This was a, a really great lecture. And thank you again for your generosity with your time to answer all these questions. It's been super informative and um, wish you all the best with the upcoming work. We'd love to see that project that you showed us a hint of uh, being uh, finished and constructed, hopefully after the situation. Yeah. And um, if you have any last uh, comments to our audience, we'd love to hear them. Um, Well, actually, I'll maybe just uh, wrap up by saying that I really very much appreciate the invitation. And actually, the questions were really spot on. And, and 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 very good. Uh, I would. I mean, there were many questions about resources, about learning, and so on. And I, I would. Uh, yeah, it's it's a hard one. I mean, it's just like keep looking, keep being curious, and assemble your own kind of things that make sense, right? And 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 take advantage of this. This uh, everyone seems to be in a sharing mode. It's great. I mean, we will come. Hopefully, the world will will end up being better after this really weird time. And we will keep sharing with each other and learning from each other. So um, uh, maybe the, the key message that I want to say is uh, be open. It, it, it pays off to be open because other people will be thankful. They will give you credit for having developed things for them. Share your experiences. We all need to design and build better. So uh, we all need all of our brains together. That's how we'll uh, make a better planet. No? Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Philippe. All right. Uh, cool. Yeah. Really great comments on the chat. Uh, thanks to our audience and thanks again to Philippe. Uh, and hope to see you soon. Yeah, cool. Thanks, Riyad. Uh, bye, everyone. Thanks for joining.